Bloody Spear at Mount Fuji. Sounds like some horror movie, but it's not. It's a samurai masterpiece from the legendary director of Tomu Uchida. It released in 1955. So there's only one fight in Bloody Spear at Mount Fuji, which is odd given the name, and it happens in the film's final 10 minutes. It's kind of clumsy. It's violent, and it's just so well choreographed, and it almost looks badly choreographed. But the scene is just so entertaining. It's just full of bloody chaos, rage, uncontrolled wild combat. And once again, I managed to just find another really great fight scene that should have been included in my top 10 best samurai duels video. I feel like as soon as I make one of those, I always find something else. So maybe I'll just like keep doing those every year. But I think this is definitely easily amongst the best samurai fights ever committed to film. So unfortunately this film doesn't really get much love or attention. In fact, I never heard of it, and when I haven't heard of it then you know you're in trouble. So big shout out to the Nerdy Ronin, he's the one that, you know, told me this movie exists. And it's a great film. And luckily this one is widely available. Arrow just came out with a really nice Blu-ray of it. And I gotta say, I just love the cover art. Whoever created that, it's definitely a work of art. I could definitely just put that on my wall. I'll also say that Arrow's just really been giving a lot of love to these types of movies lately, so keep it up. And just like with the film, the director also isn't very well known, at least in the West. His name is Tomu Uchida. Apparently, he is a film legend in Japan. And by the looks of it, he's got a pretty great resume of films, so I definitely look forward to just tracking down all of those. But Bloody Spear at Mount Fuji follows a pretty strange gap through his filmography. This was after World War II, Uchida lived in Manchuria for a decade and a half, and just upon his return, Bloody Spear was the first film that he made. And it released in 1955. And the film itself was produced with the help of Uchida's Japanese director friends. Koi. Koi. Akira Kurosawa's Seventh Samurai had also just came out, and that was the previous year. So Uchida's film was just born into this really vast field of great samurai films. And the genre was just beginning to find international fame. Kurosawa's Samurai Classic shares many of the same themes as Bloody Spear. In fact, Seventh Samurai only takes place a few decades before Uchida's. Yet, I'll say the two are just really different. Kurosawa's dealt with just a small band of uncomplicated characters that are coming together for a series of epically staged fights. Whereas Uchida's film lacks that kind of easy focus. <laughs> Bloody Spear has a pretty messy narrative, and it definitely clashes with everything in it. It's a pretty short film, it's only 94 minutes, and in that time it really just juggles a dozen of characters. And it contains pretty low stakes action, especially compared to Seven Samurai. But it's kind of refreshing though. And the ending of Bloody Spear at Mount Fuji is just this one big chaotic swing. But I'll say most of this film is pretty laid back. 
At first, it does have a lot of those same typical samurai tropes that you see a lot, but then it subverts them. In the end, we get this complex rewriting of the Chambara formula as we know it. I'll also like to add that I just love the feeling of 50s samurai films. I don't know why, but it gives me just such a great nostalgic feeling. Maybe it reminds me of the first films that I saw in this genre, which are mostly by Kurosawa. But if you're, you know, into that and you're looking for that same kind of classic feeling, then this is a film for you. So the spear in the title and in the story belongs to a character named Lord Sakawa. He's a samurai that's bound for Edo. And right away we can tell that there's something different about him. Sakawa's secretly a drinker, and his servants are specifically told that he's not allowed to touch any sake, especially for the journey. There's not really a noble quest or goal in this journey. Sakawa's just simply just going to see his family, and his cargo is just a single precious bowl. And what's interesting is his servants actually play more of an important role in the film, more so than he does. His aide, Genta, who's played by Daisuke Kato, he's famous for being one of the surviving samurai in Seven Samurai. He mostly spends his nights drinking sake, getting wasted, while his spear carrier named Gon Pachi, he is slow and I'll say ungraceful. He's apparently prone to getting a lot of blisters in his feet. We see that. In the opening scene, Uchida introduces us to these three alongside the rest of the band of travelers. There's also a father who's selling his daughter into prostitution, and that's to pay off all of his bills. Not a good father. There's a mother and daughter who are entertainers. There's a rather determined lawman. There's also a pretty sketchy miner who's hiding his small fortune. And a young orphan named Jiro. And he's a kid that idolizes the spear carrier. So the kid Jiro, I'll say pretty much behaves kind of like a puppy that's just like nipping at your heels. And he does this to Gonpachi the entire trip. And what's pretty interesting is the two child actors in this are actually the real life children of the actor who plays Gonpachi. And because of that, you could kind of see that there's a real familiar love and just care in the scenes with them. And I thought that was a really nice touch. I'll say that Jiro's relationship with Gonpachi in this instantly becomes one of the film's most uplifting subplots. And this is what provides the film with most of its lightheartedness. There's a scene where they arrive at one of their lodgings for the night, and Gompachi drops some very cold coins down the back of the boy's shirt. And for some strange Japanese reason, the boy basically has to strip butt naked in the middle of the street. And he ends up spending the money not on a place to sleep, mainly because he's a kid, instead on way too many tomatoes. This ends up giving him diarrhea the next day, and I'm only sharing this because it actually does have to do with the plot. There's actually a really long patch of this movie where just the main conflict is this boy's diarrhea. And for a while I kind of forgot what I was watching. And there's a scene where these nobles are seen having this tea ceremony off of Mount Fuji and so they block off the path. But because of Jiro, they let them go because they tell them they have a sick kid. And this is what's great about this. There's actually story developments that result from this. 
The entire last third of the film would be different had the kid not gotten diarrhea. I think that's awesome. So as you can tell, it sort of makes this a fun road trip kind of movie where just crazy things happen and one event leads to the next. The film does have a pretty big cast, and the director definitely does give them all love and care. I think one of the film's standout scenes involves the master of Sakawa. It takes place in the sake house, and it also involves the character of Genta. So Genta the entire time is just trying to stop his master from drinking sake, because he's got a drinking problem. But Sakawa just keeps insisting on Genta drinking in peace himself. But then he respectfully asks for just a single cup as the other patrons don't think that Genta's drinking alone. And then the film kind of cuts to another scene, but when it cuts back, it just shows Sakawa and he's just super drunk. The film has a lot of great standout shots. It's definitely something I look for in samurai films. Early on, there's a scene with Jiro and Gopachi where they're just walking down the road and it's midday, so the sun's just casting their long shadows over the trail. And I don't know why, I just love the way the scene looks. Later on, there's another scene with, again, Gopachi and Jiro. This time, they're on the beach with the other two traveling entertainers. And it's just the four of them. The sand, the waves, the small home. The mountains in the background and the film hardly has any talk about just the quiet life about what would happen if Gompachi decided to just hang up his spear and become a farmer and this single shot here just makes you think about that it teases this possibility to Gompachi without actually saying it if he were to just leave with the entertainer and her daughter and just turn over a new leaf. As for the sound in the film, there's a lot of long patches of quiet. The early scenes in the town feature a flute melody and drum beats that you can hear in the distance, and it's from a distant festival. And for some reason the sound just really sticks with me. Music creates this feeling where, I'll say, the characters feel like they're neither really part of the festival, but neither outside of society. They're just passing through. It's kind of like that weird liminal effect. During the whole film, you get this sense that you're watching people living in the shadow of something much greater than them. And the film's pretty clever because it reminds you of this through images. Occasionally, it'll cut to a great shot of Mount Fuji. Sometimes, it'll use really big wide shots, just framing the characters against just the endless fields or hills in the background. The film really does do a good job of shining its spotlight on the smaller characters, showing us a side of this world that we had never really considered before. And this perspective kind of takes some getting used to, but after a while, you start to love it. I think this movie is definitely inspired by John Ford's Stagecoach. It has the same, you know, ship of fools kind of structure. It's cast and just violent payoff at the end. Stagecoach kind of did the same thing with the unlikely gang of cowboys just going through the Mojave Desert. Just coming across different things along the way, crazy things happen, and one event leads to the next. It's a really great setup for a film. But both of these movies have that. If you ask me though, I think Uchida's film is head and shoulders above Ford's. I like how Bloody Spear just has this lightness of tone. In Stagecoach, I feel like by the end of the movie, no one really changed. Whereas in Bloody Spear, Pretty much everyone has 
changed a lot by the end of the story. The screenplay for Bloody Spear plays a lot with her expectations of this genre. It definitely criticizes feudal Japan, usually in samurai films of this time period. The setting it has to do with honor, there's noble warriors, usually they wage these great wars against each other and experience victories and sacrifices. Bloody Spear instead has dirty characters. It's a fake world that's filled with children with diarrhea, samurai with blisters, and just drunken masters who can't even win a sword fight. I'll say the screenplay of Bloody Spear plays a lot with our expectations. It definitely criticizes feudal Japan, which was sort of different in 50s before Kobayashi's films. The premise of this film and title, Bloody Spear at Mount Fuji, it definitely draws you in with a promise of bloody spear fights and a lot of samurai action. By the end of it, it just gives you an honest and heartfelt character drama. Everything in Bloody Spear at Mount Fuji unfolds patiently. Not only in its historical criticism and its genre subversion, changing things from what we're used to, but also with its character arcs as well. They move very slowly. With the film, Uchida gets her interest completely with every member of this cast, and he just delivers an effective, often sentimental knot of stories. I think one of the most effective stories in this is the old man who's selling his daughter into prostitution. The film really pushes this father to his breaking point, and he just gets more and more somber and depressed as the film marches on. But the character of Gompachi, I'll say, ultimately just wins this film. He enters the story as sort of a bad spear carrier, but by the end of the film, he's a great samurai. And that's just a great character arc. But it doesn't really happen until he's pushed to extreme violence. And this actor really just embodies this character who has no choice in this dark, violent world, but this is really just, you know, a kill or be kill world. After the end of the war, the samurai film genre just surged popularity. Dozens of films are being produced every year, and a lot of people just flock to these films for escapism and to be reminded of simpler days before the war. Back when the Japanese fought amongst themselves rather than overseas. But World War II completely changed the kinds of films that Uchida would make. Much of his pre-war films were lost or edited down, but his post-war work tended to be on the more nihilistic and tragic side. Each of these movies would comment either on war or Japanese post-war society. And Uchida's just big comeback film was Bloody Spear at Mount Fuji. The film really calls into question the honor and heroism of Samurai and the Shogunate. The film, or I'll say the director, gives us average characters with unfulfilled lives. The film also does a lot of criticizing of the class system. Perhaps that's why this film and its director aren't as well known in the West. The film might have been too subversive too critical, and too knowing. So, in the end, I think I definitely like this film a lot. The film had a lot of great, interesting characters, had a great final fight, and speaking of that final fight, the irony of it is that the violence isn't really noble or just or worth anything at all. You're not really even supposed to like watching that fight. Yet, I think because it's so well done that you can't help but watch it and love it. 
it's the kind of the announcement that no other samurai movie at the time would even go for. And it all made me realize, once again, just why I love 50 samurai films. I just think there's something so great about them that you just don't get anymore. I think it's good every now and then to see a film like this or a Kobayashi where it just criticizes all of that. Still, as much as I did like this film, I will say it's not without its flaws. I think the ton of side stories that the film has sort of hide the fact that the movie is missing a precise guiding line. It is a messy narrative. I think also the locations end up being somewhat repetitive. Also the movie's slow pace hasn't really aged well. I think some people are going to have a problem with that. And you know just the fact that the film itself only contains a few minutes of sword fighting scenes with the title Bloody Spear at Mount Fuji. You know, it kind of goes against its badass and misleading title. Anyway, you can get this movie really easily. I definitely recommend the Arrow Blu-ray. I just love the cover art. I think it's just such a great picture. Also, the special features give you a great commentary. can help you learn a lot about the film. Anyway, if you like what I do and you want to support me, then please become a patron. And like always... Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.